to uh, welcome to Bible Success Secrets Bible Study. Myron Golden here. We've got a bunch of folks here in our office uh, for this Bible study. A bunch of folks on Zoom. Y'all want to say hi, YouTube? Hi, YouTube. So we've got a bunch of people on YouTube. They can't see you, but they heard you. So, so we're live on YouTube. And Larry, if you, you can bring your comments up, YouTube comments up on here as well. Um, last, last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Solomon. Uh, we talked about, uh, I think it was three weeks ago, the wealth, um, the wisdom, and the wickedness of Solomon. And then two weeks ago, we talked about Solomon's social media. And then last week, we talked about um, Solomon's business model, which is the business model that we've modeled in our business. And it works as well today as it did thousands of years ago. And um, today, we're going to talk about um, a passage of scripture a lot of people are familiar with. The first time I ever heard it was from my mom. Um, and um, how, how to win without talent. And I, I called it that just because I couldn't think of anything better to call it. Um, but it's, it comes from the writings of Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the book of Ecclesiastes is confusing for a lot of people because they don't understand the theme of the entire book. The, Solomon is conveying a message. And so uh, in order for us to understand the context of the book of Ecclesiastes, we have to understand the three phases of Solomon's life, which were the wisdom, the wickedness, and the wealth. Uh, we have to understand the three phases, which were Solomon at the beginning of his life was yielded to God like completely. Right, which is why God came to him in Gibeon in a dream and said, "Ask what I shall give thee." Solomon was fully yielded to the Lord, loved the Lord with all his heart, and God said, "I'm going to give you anything you want." And Solomon prayed that prayer that we talked about several weeks ago: "Dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do, in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve." Because I believe with every fiber of my being that the reason we are all here is to please God and serve people. I. I, I like, you can make money and not please God and serve people, and you will not feel, feel fulfilled. Um, you can have health and strength and the body of a superhero, but if you don't serve God, I mean, please God and serve people, you don't feel fulfilled. Um, and I was sharing with some folks at our mastermind, we had a lot of, we had about, a, I guess, about 100 people, all, all really high-level entrepreneurs, and one of the things that I shared with them um, this past week was like the money is really a byproduct, right? It, the, the money is not the objective. It's an objective of business for sure, but it's not the objective of life, right? And, but, and so because it's not the primary objective, people will say things like, I don't care about the money. But every time I hear somebody say that, my first thought is if you'll lie about that, you'll lie about other stuff. Right? Because why are you spending 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day working for something you don't care about? Quit tripping. Stop feeling like you have to lie to justify your desire to make money to other people. Because even the people who judge you for having a desire to make money, those same people have a desire to make money. And that's why they work 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day so they can make money, so they can do the things they desire to do for the cause they care about, their family, or for themselves, or whatever the case may be. Right? So, uh, but the money is a byproduct. And if you'll understand that money is a byproduct of, of living in your purpose, you'll probably make more money than you'd ever make just by pursuing money. Okay? I don't know if that makes sense to y'all or not. I hope that makes sense on YouTube, um, uh, in Zoom, in the, here in the room. Like, I am never, you're never going to hear me say I don't care about the money because I do care about the money. I just don't care the most about the money. Right? And I believe where business owners mess up and entrepreneurs mess up and people in general mess up, not just business people and entrepreneurs, people who have jobs mess up, is they love the money and use the people, right? People who fill out a job application, promise to do a good job, and then like they, they goof off and they're not productive. Those people do that because they're using the people who gave them a job because they love the money that those people had, right? Entrepreneurs who sell stuff to people that's less than they're purporting it to be are using the people and loving the money. Don't love the money and use the people. Use the money and love the people. And then you'll be able to 
hopefully grow into the place in your life where you can use the money to love the people, right? Um, oh, y'all coming in. You're fine. You're fine. And y'all can walk across. Uh, so as you're coming in, just understand these cameras are only up here, so y'all can walk anywhere and have a seat anywhere. You're fine. It's all good. So, 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 so use the money to love the people. Um, had the privilege yesterday of having, going out to lunch with some of our clients, and, and I think there were probably 15 of us. And uh, the young lady who was serving us was literally about to clock out. And I said, well, I'd like for her to stay in service. So, so cool, she stayed in service, did a great job. And um, we had literally two, three, three big tables and one small table of people. It was, I, I, I say it was 15 people, it might have been 20 people. There was, no, it was more than 15. So it might have been 20 people. Anyway, we were all there. She did a great job serving us. And I thanked her profusely. And then was able to bless her with a $500 tip. And I'm not, I'm not telling you that because I want you all to think I'm somebody because I gave her a $500 tip. It has nothing to do with it. But this girl was crying her eyes out because she just got out of the hospital because she had not that long ago tried to commit suicide. Right? And oftentimes when people find themselves in that state, they find themselves in that state because they don't believe anybody cares. Yeah, you can walk across. It's fine. It's, you're not, you don't even need to duck. Those cameras are just up here. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> So we got, we got a lot of stuff going on. For those of you on YouTube who are wondering, what in the world's going on over there? So we did an event yesterday, and I invited the people from the event to come to Bible study this morning. And so the way we have our office set up, they are concerned about walking in front of the cameras. But you, can't, you, can, you don't need to duck. You can just walk. It's fine. So um, it's fine. It's not a problem. So, so, so use the money to love the people. Use the money to love the people. Use the money to love the people. Like, I can't emphasize that enough. In fact, like, look, go through your day looking for people to serve and looking for ways to serve the people you come across. I promise you, it'll change your life for the rest of your life. Stop being so self-absorbed and self-consumed that all you can think about is me, I, I, me, mine. I made up that word, <laughs> right? Because you will not feel fulfilled until you tap into the purpose for which you were created, which is you were created to create. Somebody asked a great question on YouTube yesterday because when I'm teaching, I teach that God created three categories in creation. Uh, he created creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the grass, the trees, right? Um, uh, the water, the, the sun, the moon, the planets. He created creation. He created creatures. The dogs, the cats, the alligators, the chimpanzees, the giraffes, and the butterflies, and the ants, and the mosquitoes. And then he created creators, human beings. And they said, um, why do you say that God created us as creators instead of creatives? Because only God creates. Well, because God, we are created in the image of God, and the first thing God tells us about God is that he's creative in the beginning. God, like God is love, but that's not the first thing he tells us. God is holy, but that's not the first thing he tells us. God is just, but that's not the first thing he tells us, right? God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, but none of those are the first thing he tells us about himself. The first thing he tells us about himself is that he created the heavens and the earth. And if you ask yourself, well, why would he do that? He didn't need a heaven. He certainly didn't need an earth. So why would he do that? He did it. This is the conclusion I've come to, and I can't prove this, but it's the only answer I can find. If you find one better, please share it but he created everything as an extension of his creativity, right? He created because he is creative and therefore it is his nature to create. So the first thing he tells us about himself is that he's creative. The first thing he tells us about ourselves is, he, is that he created us in his image, which means he created us to create stuff and he made us to make stuff. So the, like our fulfillment in life comes from creating. Are y'all tracking? But creating by itself doesn't create complete fulfillment. It's just, it's a part of fulfillment. The other part is connection, right? So we, it's creation, and then connection also provides fulfillment. Everything that God made in Genesis chapter 1, he said, it a, God said it was so, God saw that it was good. There's only one thing God made, and then he said it, the first time God said wasn't, something wasn't good, here's what he said, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, yes, he made him and helped meet or sufficient for him. But the broader sense of that, it's not good for human beings to be by themselves. Right? 
People need people. Why? Because God didn't put every aspect of his creativity inside of any of us, but he put some aspect of his creativity inside of all of us. And so therefore, he created us to be interdependent so that my lack of skill requires your skill and your lack of skill requires my skill. Is what I'm saying making sense, y'all? And so, he, so we feel fulfilled when we are when we, in creation, in connection, and lastly, in contribution. And the reason there was contribution is because man sinned, and the only thing that could redeem man was God. And so he contributed his son as the sacrifice for our sin. So God is fulfilled through creation, connection, and contribution. We are, we are fulfilled through creation, connection, and contribution, okay? Um, and why do I say creators instead of creatives? It is true that only God creates, and this is what the person said, it, only God creates out of nothing. That's true, only God creates out of nothing. But we create out of something. We take two things that were not a new thing and make a new thing out of those things. Or we take three things or four things or five things that are not a thing and then make a new thing out of those things. That's what I mean when I say we are creators. God is a creator who creates something out of nothing. We are creators who create something out of something. Okay, so. So anyway, understand the book of, so the, to understand the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon was fully yielded to God at the beginning of his life. As a result of that, God made him the wisest, wealthiest king in history. He said, because you've asked this thing, you've asked for a wise and understanding heart to discern judgment, to please me and to serve people, I'm going to give you what you asked for, but I'm also going to give you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you great riches so that no one before you was richer than you and no one after you will be richer than you. Now, Solomon didn't ask for that. So for those of you who are confused and think that God wants his people to be broke, I promise you that is a pagan religious idea. It is not a biblical idea. And, and I know that's a very, what I just said is a very strong statement. But I wanted it to be strong so you weren't confused about what I meant. Okay? Um, for those of you who think that God wants his people to be broke, you are confused. And then people will ask questions about passages that they take out of script, uh, passages of scripture that they take out of context to justify the brokenness that's been perpetrated through pagan, pagan idolatrous religions and passed down through the pagan idolatrous religions, through Catholicism, into Protestantism. And now people are confused about the concept of money. Money isn't everything, but it is what it is. And it answers all things. I got that from the Bible, by the way. So, God gave Solomon riches. If riches are evil, why has God given somebody who's totally yielded him riches if it's evil? So God's going to give you an evil reward for doing something good. Like, think about it. That's all I'm saying. Just think about it. Okay, so. In the middle of Solomon's life, God told him, though, after God gave him this, he said, I'm going to give you great riches. He said, I'm also going to make you wiser than anybody who lived before you and anybody who will live after you. And then he said, anybody who comes up against you, I'm going to put the life of your enemies in your hand. In other words, anybody who comes against you, they are guaranteed to lose. And then go back and read um, 1 Kings chapter 10. He said, as long as you will walk in my statutes as your father David did walk, then I will bless you. But if you turn away from me, I'm turning away from you. That's what God said. And human beings, one of the things I discovered about being human is this. Our minds, I mean, our flesh does not retain truth for very long. Like we have to be reminded, like, seem like every five minutes. Hey, bro, that don't work. I know, but I'm going to do it again just to see if it works this time. It don't work. Right? So, so, interestingly enough, in chapter 10, God told Solomon, just walk in my statutes. Don't get ahead of yourself. Don't accumulate horses and lead my people back into Egypt. Some trust in chariots, we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in horses. Each. Horses were a symbol of power. Egypt is a type of the world. God said, don't lead my people 
back into the world for their source of power. That's why he said, don't go back to Egypt and accumulate horses under yourself and lead my people back into the bondage of Egypt. Right? And then he said, don't accumulate wives to yourselves. Solomon missed that one. He didn't have two wives. He didn't have three. He had 300. 300 wives. What you going to do with 300 wives? He had 700. Con- Solomon had 1,000. Wi- what? All right, bro. What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? He said, don't accumulate wealth for yourself. See, this is where people get confused, right? Well, the Bible says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth and wealth and rust is corrupt when thieves break through and steal. It does say that. That's right. That's what it says. So guess what? Don't lay up treasures, don't lay up for your treasures upon the earth. But it also says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I'm not supposed to lay up treasures upon the earth for myself. I'm supposed to lay up treasures on the earth for Anthony and Dee Dee and John and Ari and any other project that comes through me. I am building their wealth so they don't have to start from scratch. And all of us, every adult listening to the sound of my voice, you know you would be better off today if your parents had had that same philosophy. And what happens as we go through life, anyway, that's, I don't have time to go there. That's a rabbit that I'm going to have to chase a different day. So Solomon forgot. And then he married, and, and he didn't just marry 300, he married 300 pagan, idolatrous, idol worship, idol worshiping, wicked women. And here's what the scripture says, they turned his heart from God. What are you doing, bro? Are y'all tracking? So Solomon spent the beginning of his life yielded to God. He spent the middle of his life rebelling against God. Rebelling against God. And then at the end of his life, he came to his senses. And when he came to his senses at the end of his life, so we didn't have to take that same journey, he wrote us the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to tell you the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. So from now on, for the rest of your life, when you read it, you'll understand it. You know it says in Ecclesiastes over and over and over and over and over and over again, all is vanity and vexation of spirit, right? Vanity means emptiness. Vexation means torture. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. So what is the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes? The theme of the book of Ecclesiastes is this. If you live your life, to fulfill all the desires, only to fulfill the desires that you have while you're in this life, you've wasted your life and tortured your soul. That's the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. Wow, that's pretty simple, right? So, he was like, yes, if God has given you riches, he gave you those riches because it's the gift of God. But don't think that's what life is about, because if you do, you've wasted your life. Don't think, yeah, yeah, eat, drink, and be merry. But don't think that's the purpose of life, because if you do, you've wasted your life. Enjoy your life, but don't make enjoying your life the purpose of life, because if you do, you've wasted your life. Are are y'all tracking? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to say this in a way that's not confusing. I love having experiences. I love to play golf, I love to play my guitar, I love to go on vacation, I love to fly, like take flying lessons. I like to experience life to the fullest. But I, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm confused to think that all of those things are what life is about. Life is about creation, connection, and contribution. And if I don't forget that, my con- creating things out of things God has already created, connecting vertically with God, connecting horizontally with other people, contributing to the work of God, contributing to other people's lives, being blessed to be a blessing. Okay. So, Solomon, now that was all introductory. <laughs> I, be- because, because what happens is people read things and there are, you have to understand, there's not one single solitary isolated doctrine in the entire Bible. It all supports the rest of it. And it does not contradict. And if you come to the conclusion that it does contradict, what's actually happened is your misunderstanding and misinterpretation of it has contradicted the scripture. Are we tracking? Okay. 
So, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, <coughs> excuse me, um, verses 10 and 11. It says, For whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And then he says, And I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. This is where we come, like, how do you win without talent? The race is not to the swift. In other words, the fastest person does not always win. The race is not to the swift. Um, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Now, if, when you're reading, when you're reading um, Ecclesiastes um, 7, 8, and 9, you'll see that God is talking to us about walking in integrity, but just be... But, but he will, it also tells us that walking in integrity doesn't guarantee outcomes, right? Um, it talks about walking in ingenuity. It talks about walking in intention and intentionality. But those things don't guarantee income. He said, he's like, he's like here's, here's what I've, after all of my, I, I, I've sought out all wisdom. He's had more wisdom than anybody. And then he went and learned more stuff. He said, this is what I've learned. Nothing in life is guaranteed except death. How wild is that? But if you think about what that means, because I said this yesterday when I was teaching, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before. People ask me, Myron, why are you so intense? Why are you so intentional? I'm dying. My awareness of the fact that I'm dying causes me to desire to squeeze every ounce of life out of life and not just exist. Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Y'all come on in, you're fine. So to squeeze every, and you don't even have to worry about the cameras. There's, we got some seats over here. We got some back there. You're good. Yeah, just make yourselves at home. It's fine. So, so, so life, you are not, the, the thing that's guaranteed, when it says, like, here's what, when it says time and chance happen to them all, it's, look, here's what it's saying. Everybody's going to die. Okay? The race is not too swift nor about too strong. So, so then who is the race to? Who does win the battle? Who does gain the riches? Who does get the favor? It told us in verse 9. It says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. First person I ever heard say that was my mom. I'm like, okay. Like, I don't know how your parents talk to y'all. My parents are like, oh, so you, you, you came in here and did this half job and you think you're done? Hmm. I didn't know it was a half job, but uh, okay. Like, my parents were not playing. They, were, they weren't playing. They made sure when we had work to do, the work got done, okay? And I better not think about playing until we got our work done, okay? So, the, so he said, it says in verse, um, verse 11, it says, I returned and saw under, um, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 10, whatsoever thy hand find do, do it with thy might. In other words, everything you do, put everything into it. My mom would say, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing right. If I might add to my mom's statement, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing with your might. But it also means, if it's not worth doing with your might, it's probably not worth doing. How about that? There are so many, I, I, I promise you, number one common denominator I have discovered in people who struggle their way through life, number one common denominator, they focus on distraction and ignore intention. What does that mean? They focus on distraction and ignore intention. People who excel in any arena of life, you know what they do? They focus on intention and ignore distraction. It's the exact opposite. How many of y'all tracking? How many of y'all picking up what I'm putting down? What do I mean intention? So I'm, I'm not just going to say that word. By distraction, I mean anything you are focused on that does not move the needle in your favor. It's a distraction. You're broke. You're watching four hours of football on Sunday and four hours of football on Monday. It's a distraction designed to keep you broke. You're broke. You have a favorite television show. It's a distraction designed to keep you broke. Your bowling league, your golf league, your fantasy football. Like, it, 
There's nothing wrong with any of those things in of themselves. But if your life isn't working, why in the world would you give any attention or intention to something that doesn't matter? You know, the thing that blows my mind more than anything else, I've actually seen this on Instagram before. Two grown men fist fighting at a football game about some people who don't know neither one of them. Wait, 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 bro, bro, help me understand what you're saying. You're going to get in a fist fight, risk getting injured, getting your teeth knocked out, or knocking somebody else's teeth out, going to jail, or going to the hospital about a, about a game that adds nothing to your bottom line, and you could end up going to jail over some people you don't, that don't know you? Are you serious? I'm sorry, y'all forgot to put my phone on going live. Okay, there we go. Are you serious? I'm going to tell you something. When you get focused on intention, people who are distracted are going to become mighty uncomfortable around you. You know what they're going to say? All you do is work. All you do is think about making money. All you care about is money. All you care about is being successful. You're so out of balance. How many of y'all heard that? Come on now, where are my people? How many of y'all heard that? Okay. Can somebody please remind me of that verse that says, thou shalt be balanced? I forgot. Where's it at? Here's the problem. A bunch of people who don't understand how life works have programmed a bunch of other people who don't understand how life works to think that being balanced is the primary objective of life. Well, it's not. Balance is a season. It's not an objective. It's not a standard. It's a season. It's never winter and summer in the same place at the same time. Winter's a season. Guess what? Here's what we know when it's winter. It's cold, but it ain't always going to be cold. Right? It's winter, but it ain't always going to be winter. If I just wait long enough, what's going to happen? Spring. If I wait a little longer, what's going to happen? Summer, right? And when it's summer, it ain't winter. And when it's winter, it ain't summer. At least not in the same place at the same time. Y'all tracking? Well, watch this. Balance is a season. The opposite season of balance is focus. And just like when it's summer, it ain't winter. And when it's winter, it ain't summer. When you're in focus, you're out of balance. And when you're in balance, you're out of focus. And I've got news for you. I'm going to tell you something. If you're broke and you don't like being broke, you should stop seeking to be in balance and start focusing. I'm going to tell you, if you will focus, here's what happens. When you first start out in the season of focus, season of focus seems like it's never going to end. Right? You start out as an entrepreneur. Forget an entrepreneur. You start out as, as an adult with bills and a job. And it feels like this ain't ever going to let up. Am I telling you all the truth? You start a business, and here's what you do. A whole bunch of work, a little bit of money. A whole bunch of work, a little bit of money. And people are saying, so how's that thing you're doing working? <laughs> y'all know why y'all laughing, don't you? Right? Because this, this, is, this is real, right? How's that thing you're doing? Whatsoever thy hand fighters do, do it with thy might. Here's how it's working. How much money you made? They used to ask me that when I first got started in multi-level marketing. I didn't even make my first. I was in network marketing, selling insurance and investment for a year and a half before I made my first sale. You still doing that thing? You still got that job? That's why, like literally, I would say that to people. You still got that job you hate? You ain't the only one who can be ugly. I know how to be ugly. I took classes, right? <laughs> right? And so, so, so how much money you made so far? I don't know. I ain't done counting it up yet. <laughs> Leave me alone, <laughs> right? Whatsoever your hand, how do you win without talent? Put everything you have into everything you do. And if it's not worth putting everything you have into it, it's probably not worth doing. Here's what it takes. It, ta it requires the most energy to overcome inertia and create momentum. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? I wish Willis was here because he's a rocket scientist, and he knows way more about this, because he's designed rockets and launched them in the space and all that fun stuff. You know, he used to work for NASA. And 
Interestingly enough, they say that when you launch a rocket into space, it burns 90% of the fuel leaving the Earth's atmosphere. And right before it breaks through the atmosphere, the rocket ship vibrates and shakes so violently you feel like it's going to explode. And then it's like, and you break through, and then you feel nothing. But you have to be going fast enough to break through the atmosphere. You know, what that's, you know what that speed, that momentum is called? The momentum that's necessary to break through the atmosphere? It's called escape velocity. And see, the reason a lot of people never succeed in business is they never put enough energy in in the beginning to create enough momentum to escape the atmosphere of struggle because they haven't figured this out. Whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with your might. See, the work that I do now looks easy. You know why? Because it is. Because I'm in orbit. 90% of the fuel is used to escape the Earth's atmosphere. And they say, I, I don't, I don't, I wish Willis was here so I could ask him if this is true, but this is what I've heard. I, I, we got, I, you could Google it, I, but, but it's pretty remarkable. They say when a rocket is orbiting the Earth at 24,000 miles an hour, it burns zero fuel. How's that possible? I, I, I don't burn zero fuel. I burn some. But I don't burn anywhere near as much as I used to. I remember when I first got started in business, I'd go out and do an event. I'd come back. I'd work like a three-legged mule to fulfill all the stuff that I just sold. Then I'd make some more stuff for the next event that was coming up next. And some nights, literally, I'd come home, I'd work till two, three o'clock in the morning, fall asleep on my office floor and not go to bed so I wouldn't miss my flight the next morning. People don't see that part, right? But whatsoever your hand find it to do, do it with thy might. Put everything you have into everything you do. And if it's not worth doing it that way, it's probably not worth doing it all. How do you win without talent? put everything you have into everything you do. You know why that causes people to win? Because almost nobody does it. When you operate at that level, you have almost no competition. I want you to think about that. When you put everything you do and everything you got, that's why, it's, it's so interesting. It's so interesting how all these principles start playing off, playing off each other. You remember a couple weeks ago when I talked about Price's Law? Anybody remember that? Right, Price's Law. So Price's Law says that 50% of the output of any domain is produced by the square root of that domain. What does that mean? That means if you have nine salespeople, three of them produce half the profits. This is, going, this is so good. If you have 100 salespeople, the square root of 100 is 10, 10 times 10 is 100. If you have 100 salespeople, 10 of them produce half the profit. If you have 100 employees, 10 of them produce half the profit. Y'all tracking? It gets crazier. It gets crazier. If you have a business, I want you to wrap your mind around this. If you have a business with a million employees, hypothetically, 1,000 of them would produce half the profit. What do we learn from Price's Law? Here's what we learn. Mediocrity scales exponentially, excellence scales incrementally. I said that too fast, didn't I? What do I mean mediocrity scales exponentially? This is why, like, this is why you can be, you can be, that's why you got, you got a multi-level marketing company that has um, uh, 100 times 100, has 10,000 people in it. 100 people produce 50% of the revenue of that business. Price is law. 100 times 100 is 10,000. Mind blowing. Why? Because generally speaking, when it comes time to do it, people put a little bit, I put a little bit of might. Whatsoever my hand finds do, I'll do it with a little bit of might. A whole bunch of people willing to do that. But there are fewer people willing to do whatever my hand finds do, I'll do it with some might. There's fewer people than the first group. Whatsoever my hand finds do, I'll do it with all my might. 
almost nobody. You will stand head and shoulders above almost everybody who thinks they're your competition if when you are in the atmosphere, inside the atmosphere of struggle, you put everything you have into everything you do. Almost nobody else will do that. I'm just keeping it real. This is how it works. And, 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 and isn't it amazing, though, that it's easy to figure out what I have to do to be the best? Whatsoever my hand finds, do, do it with my might. Why? Because there's no work in the grave where I'm going. That's what he said. He says, because you're going to die. So if you're going to do industry, he said, that's what it said right there. Verse 10, whatsoever thy hand finds to do, do it with thy might. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not, um, I'm sorry, whatsoever thy hand finds to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work. That's industry. There's no industry in the grave. You're going to the grave. Guess what? Oh, I'm so tired. Well, you'll have plenty of time to sleep after you're dead. Get the work done. And is that too tough? He said, there's no, like, like here's, what, here's what Yeshua said. I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day for the night cometh when no man can work. The sunset of our, all of our lives is coming. Why don't we do everything we can to squeeze all the juice out of this experience of life and impact as many people as we can, connect with as many people as we can, create as much as we can, com, com, contribute as much as we can. Instead of just existing and waiting to die. There's not going to be anything. To, I just don't like where, well, you won't have any to do when you're dead. So you're going to be all right. There's no work. That's what he says. Nor device. Hmm. What's device? Invention. There's no invention. You die, there's nothing to create. You're done. You want to create something? Be about the business. You want to write a book? Be about the business. You want to create a new software? Be about the business. Because we're, we're, it says there's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Where? In the grave, where do we go? Where we're going? Nor knowledge. What's that? Intelligence. What's that telling us? Learn as much as you can while you're alive, because there's not going to be anything to learn when you're dead. I'm blown away. Here's what blows me away. Somebody will spend 20 years of their life learning and mastering a skill. They'll spend two years writing it in a book. You can read the book and get the leverage of 20 years of experience in two hours. You just don't like to read. Okay. Well, when you're dead, you won't have to read. <laughs> like, aren't, don't you wonder how it works? What? Life. <laughs> don't you wonder how it works? I want to know how the whole thing works. I want to find out as many things as I can so I can make my experience of life and the experience of life of the people I come in contact with so much better, I can't stop learning. Because one of the most powerful things I've ever learned is the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Mm, I wish I had some help in here. What's that? Okay. Wow. <laughs> and then, so, so there's no industry. There's no invention. There's no intelligence, nor wisdom. What's wisdom? Um, in the grave, where do we go? Wisdom is skill. It's the application of knowledge. So there's no implementation in the grave where I'm going. As long as I'm alive, I can keep getting better. And guess what? I don't have to get better than you. I don't even want to get better than you. I just want to get better than me. I want today's Myron to be better than yesterday's Myron. I want tomorrow's Myron to be better than, yesterday, than today's Myron. I want next year's Myron to be better than this year's Myron. And if I will live like I'm dying, you know that country song that says, uh, live like you're dying? Anyway, it's a country song, something about, I'd go skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing, right? You know, Harrison's with me, you with me, ain't you Harrison? Okay, yeah, uh, 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. Okay, anyway, so, so like, I'd li like, live like you're dying, because you are. And put everything you have into everything you do. I, it's interesting to me, it's interesting to me that somebody like me, and I know this is going to sound crazy to y'all, but it's interesting to me, it's amazing to me, that somebody like me can win. Here's why. I was born the second of seven brothers. I contracted polio as an infant. By the time I was 13 years of age, my left leg was two inches shorter than my right leg. 
I wore a metal brace on my leg like I do now, but I also wore orthopedic shoes, which look like granny boots off Beverly Hillbillies, except for my left shoe had a two-inch sole. So when I was on the playground and we were playing kickball, I would always get picked last. I loved school all the way through and did really well all the way through the third grade. <laughs> and it went downhill from there. <laughs> I can remember in the third grade, sitting there and thinking to myself, I had a good third grade teacher though, so that helped. I can remember sitting there in the third grade saying, why are they telling me this again? I got this already. Why are they wasting, like literally third grade, why are they wasting my time? That's what I thought when I was in third grade. Why are they wasting my time? I already know how to do this. What are we doing? This, what is, this is dumb. And I lost interest. I was like, oh, all they're going to do is continue to keep saying the same thing over and over? Maybe that's to, to this day why I just hate redundancy. Tell me once, but please don't tell me 16 times the same thing. Anyway, I did well in school all the way through. But after that, I did poorly in school. I got all A's and B's all the way through the third grade. After that, it was mostly C's, D's, and F's. And more of D's and F's than C's. Okay. <laughs> just keeping it real. I can remember a guidance, my guidance counselor telling me if I didn't straighten it up, I was going to end up in jail. I remember that. I remember coming to Christ, going to a Christian school for two years, working a bus route, bringing kids to school on a Sunday school bus. I was at that church for two years, and during the time I was at that church, I brought more people to that church than any other person, including the pastor. When I graduated from high school, they had this big awards banquet. June 5th, 2000, 1980. I remember it like it was yesterday. Graduated salutatory to my class. It was a class of two. My little brother Mike was the valedictorian. Now you all know the rest of the story. <laughs> real talk. Real talk. No, that's real. <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny, but it's true. I see all these people getting these awards. I know I'm going to get something. Right? I know. Like, like I know. I'm going to get something. I did. I got one award. It was called the most likely to get on your nerves award. I'm not even, I'm not kidding. It was a little pill bottle that said most likely to get on your nerves award. Had some earmuffs made out of those little pipe cleaners. I was like, really? Really? I, re I wish I would have kept it, but I didn't. I took it outside after graduation and stepped on it. I was like, Wow. Why am I doing all this? I mean, I was doing it for God, but these people can't even appreciate the contribution that I made. I'm blown away because I'm colorblind, I'm dyslexic, um, directionally really dyslexic, and yet, by the grace of God, I'm able to build a business and impact people's lives. You know why? Because my mom said, Whatsoever your hand finds it to do, do it with all your might. And I didn't know that that was a formula for success and winning, even if you didn't have talent. And I had some talent, but I didn't know I had talent. Nobody was saying, hey, you got all this talent. Go, hey, go work on that. I didn't have that. And I'm telling you, if you, this is King Solomon, by the way. This is a guy who was yielded to God at the beginning of his life, like backslidden as he could possibly be in the middle of his life, and at the end of his life, he came back, he said, this is what I've learned. I, I've sought out all the wisdom, all the wisdom of the world, all of the wisdom of spiritual wisdom, physical wisdom, like, I've given myself everything my heart desired, and here's what I've learned from all of that. If you live your life for the experiences of life under the sun, you've wasted your life and tormented yourself. So, what did he say at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes? Watch this. Here's how he wraps up the whole book. Last two verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Here's what it says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So what conclusion do I come to after all of this? Here's what he said. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Hmm. Sounds like this whole idea of pleasing God and serving people is a good mission to be on. And whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. So I hope this blesses you. The folks on YouTube, share it with somebody. What's the other thing? Subscribe. What's the other thing? Comment. Like it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
and all the other YouTube stuff that you're supposed to do on YouTube. Y'all are YouTubers. Y'all know what y'all supposed to do. Do that thing. All right. And for everybody here, thank y'all for coming. Stay blessed by the best. I look forward to seeing y'all next Wednesday by the grace of God. All right, my Zoomsters.